listening to Hold On a Minute, a podcast by UNFPA Asia and the Pacific. This podcast series presents inspiring and powerful stories on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women across the Asia Pacific region. I am Pupei Chawarat Yong Tidanun, your host. On this episode of Hold On a Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, entitled Every Girl Counts, we take a look at the dangers of child marriages and what is being done to end the inhumane practice. Child marriage is a human rights violation. It is an issue of gender inequality and a violation of human rights of young girls, threatening their lives, health, well-being, and futures. Despite having laws against it in 96% of the countries around the world, the reality is legislations fail to translate to real application in real communities. This is especially true in times of economic stress, as girls at most risk live in poor marginalized rural communities. In Southeast Asia, 36% of girls are married before the age of 18. One in 10 girls are married off before the age of 15. With the issue being so deeply rooted in harmful social and gender norms, the UNFPA UNICEF Global Program to End Child Marriage aims to help facilitate positive choices for girls through the gender-transformative approach, promoting positive masculinity to end child marriages. This is supported by Comprehensive Sexuality Education, or CSE, to promote sexual and reproductive health of adolescents and youth. To get up close and personal on how this really affects young girls and their communities, here's the story of Maya. My name is Maya and I am 16. My father is a school teacher and my mother is a midwife. I have two sisters, one older and one younger. I live in a town not too far from the city or the mountains. It means that on weekends and on school holidays, we can visit friends and family quite easily. I love school and I'm going to be a teacher, just like my father. He often tells us wonderful stories about his students who grow up and live very interesting lives. One girl he taught is now a young mayor in our town. My mother's job is very interesting too. She is a midwife, so she looks after pregnant women, helping them before, during and after they give birth. As a midwife, my mother meets many women and girls in our community. She shares some of the stories with me so that I too can learn from them. Some stories are very sad as they are about girls my own age or younger who have been pushed into marriage. It means that they have to leave school early and have babies soon afterwards. Girls my age can have a lot of difficulty being pregnant and giving birth. And sometimes, they lose their life. This is so sad. My mother was so sad to witness this situation recently. She told me about a girl who was my age from a village close by, who was forced to marry an older man. The girl did not know who to go to and who to speak to when she got pregnant. She faced many complications and sadly, she died. Her death could have been prevented, especially if she was older when she gave birth. I signed up this year for a girls empowerment club in our town. It's wonderful. We learn about sexual reproductive health and even negotiation skills. I have learned that as a girl, I count in my community. I also really want to be able to help girls my age so that they can live their life to their fullest. Girls are just too young to get married and to become mothers. We can lose our dreams of becoming somebody important one day, of having a job and helping our families and communities. I am so inspired by my mother's work and I hope that I too can help girls so that we can build a better future for everyone. Hold on a minute, a podcast series by UNFBA Asia Pacific. It is clear from Maya's story that it takes more than policies to create a positive change in such a deep-rooted harmful norm. To learn more about how the UNFPA and its partners are working to empower young women, I'm excited to have our two guest speakers. Upala Devi, 
is the Asia-Pacific Regional Gender Advisor and Human Rights Technical Advisor at UNFPA, based in Bangkok. With 22 years in the development field, she has worked with most of the top organizations from UNDP to UNICEF, UN Women, ILO, and Save the Children Fund in the UK and Sweden. Opala has contributed extensively to various books, journals, and policy papers on gender, gender-based violence, child rights, human rights, and development. She has often spoken on issues of rights and development, including at the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Senate, and Harvard's John F. Kennedy School. Indira Pancholi is a feminist human rights activist and founder of Mahila Jan Aditkar Samati, a women-led organization based in central Rajasthan, India. Over the past 25 years, she has worked closely with rural and urban women, children, and adolescents. Her work ranges from grassroots actions to training female leaders in local self-governments. She specializes in promoting gender justice, social development, and addressing violence against women. Indira has also published extensively on sexual reproductive health and rights. Hello, Upala and Indira. Thank you so much for being with us here on our podcast. Upala Indira, thank you so much for being with us here on our podcast today, because um, the issue of child marriage has always been uh, a very uh, serious and a very big concern for people throughout the whole world. But, you know, nowadays, perhaps maybe people need to understand it more and how it has evolved over the years. Upala, we've recently just heard the story of Maya in our podcast, who's really smart and a very motivated young woman, wants uh, to try to help other girls from early marriage and pregnancy. When we take a look at child marriage, what reasons might young girls be pushed into child marriage or early or forced unions by their families? Thank you for asking me the question. And, um, you know, we have these reasons which have been there for the last many, many decades. And these reasons are primarily poverty, harmful gender and social norms that places a low value on girls, as well as um, at the end of the day, in some countries, for example, in some countries in Southeast Asia, for example, in Cambodia and Laos, we've also found that adolescent pregnancies actually lead to early unions as well, where a girl is forced to live with her partner because she's pregnant. That normally is not the case in South Asia, where the girls get pregnant after getting married. So there are different factors and reasons, including poverty, social and gender norms, which are very, very harmful and discriminatory towards women and girls, as well as uh, you know adolescent pregnancies. However, in recent years, there are some other factors that are contributing to child mar- child early and forced marriages. And as we know right now, the world has been really rocked by a series of shocks and stresses. Uh, the most, and I list them as such, first is the most severe pandemic that we've seen in a century, COVID-19, and the after effects of COVID-19. We are having two major wars playing out right now, which will also have an impact in terms of economics and migration. We are having the worst global energy crisis since the 1970s, the fastest global inflation in the 21st century, which is leading to spiral inflation and food insecurity. We have a record global debt burden, and we have increasingly visible impacts of climate change. And I would not even call it climate change anymore. I would actually say it's a climate crisis. All of this will lead to, unfortunately, and even higher incidences of child marriage, not just in countries of South Asia, Southeast Asia and Africa, but we'll be actually seeing many other countries joining as well in a very bad way because of all the factors that I'm listing right now. It's quite, you could say, I don't want to say depressing, but it's it's kind of saddening, isn't it, that uh, we have seen this problem uh, evolve into uh, such an issue with all these uh, different pressures, as you mentioned, uh, over the, the recent years. Indar, um, you've worked with communities. Uh, what are some of the problems that child brides encounter after their marriage is so early in life? 
And do girls, young women, and other women have a lot of knowledge about sexual and reproductive health? Thank you for this opportunity to talk about our experiences on this important issue. Uh, what Uppala is saying is a larger picture. I will come at the local level. As we know, child marriage is a patriarchal way of controlling girls at a very young age. As a feminist, we understand in feminist discourse, this control is not only about their physical labor, but also women's sexuality and reproduction from very early age. Uh, child marriage is a, uh, is a way of snatching away their freedom of expression and independent thinking through a strict social norms. From the childhood, young girls are taught to remain silent, accept whatever elderly people ordered them, and accept the gendered work division within their families. The society requires a female to completely surrender her being to her family and community, you know, and this is done right from a girl's childhood. It's remaining till now. Uh, after a long way to development we go through, uh, child marriage deeply impacts girls' overall development and well-being. Due to the practice of child marriage, girls aged 14, 15, or 16, or whatever, are forced to remain under the wheel. They remain invisible to community for some years and are deprived of education and other basic needs. If they raise their voices even for a small relief, they face violence. Many girls face many forms of violence throughout life. Their sexual experiences are painful and undignified. They face pressure to get pregnant and bear a child immediately after marriage within some months. If they fail in this, within a year time, they face a stigma and the families start talking about bringing another wife of her husband and abandoning first one. Obviously, they lack of any understanding of their bodies, their sexual and reproductive health. If any girl talk about these issues, they are considered to be a bad character or a bad girl. Even senior women do not know much about the issue. Wow. Um, and you know, it's definitely an issue that I, I personally, as an outsider, is I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't really changed in Iraq. Have you seen a bit of a change in terms of how uh, people have access to sexual and reproductive health education? Yeah. So uh, I can tell there is no formal system to uh, learn these girls about uh, sexual. We don't have formal system to educate girls about the uh, sexual and reproductive system. Uh, we don't have sexual education in our formal education system. There is a long struggle within women's movement to add into the formal education system in this uh, reproductive and sexual health issues. And, you know, moving from uh, the case studies that you've just mentioned in terms of the communities that you've been involved in, Dara, to Apala, you have recently been on a field visit, uh, including in Nepal. Did you meet some child brides? And if so, what did you learn from your conversations from them? I actually, yes, I was on a field visit, true, but I actually did not meet, I did not have an opportunity to meet child bird brides per se, but I met potential child bird brides girls between the ages of 14 and 17 who are at the risk of getting married off by the parents. So I visited schools that are run by UNFPA and UNICEF in very, very rural interior areas in Nepal. And really this group is a very vulnerable, marginalized group of people because they are religious minorities in a Hindu country. Nepal is a Hindu country, but these are Muslim minorities living in Nepal and they're very poor. So in a way, they're doubly marginalized, firstly, because of their poverty status, as well as the fact that they're also religious minority. And hence, they have less access to policies and programs that are there in for, for access in terms of uh, the government access. So what's happening is that I went on many of these visits over a period of three days, schools, community centers, meeting with uh, community custodians of culture, for example, police people, uh, religious leaders, Hindu religious leaders, Muslim religious leaders, and the girls themselves. And what I learned is that never say never, the courage and the resilience that they exhibit daily in their lives 
telling the parents that I'm not going to get married, telling the parents that I'm going to go to school every day, a feeling of all the different empowerment programs that UNFPA and UNICEF have rolled out for them. And then engaging in being self-advocates in their communities to say no against child marriage has really, really, really made me feel that, yes, what we do may be a tiny drop in the ocean, but when you actually see the work on the ground and the impact it's had on the lives of girls and the communities at large, I think the lessons that I've learned are courage, resilience, the power of innovations, and the ability to empower the even the most poorest, vulnerable, marginalized is actually possible. Thank you so much, Apollo, because now I can kind of sense the the feeling of, of each girl. And it does take a lot to give that confidence to that individual girl who's not even a woman yet, you know, to stand up, but not only to her family or her parents, but her society to to say that she does have her own rights and, um, you know, she deserves better. Indira, with your work in Rajasthan, India, can you share us a bit about an example of your organization's work and maybe talk about how you've been working to tackle child marriage there? Uh, what Upala said, engaging them self-advocating is very important strategy, uh, I see. Uh, we are working the most effective strategy that we have used is to build the rights perspective based on constitutional rights and human rights framework of the girls themselves uh, to align with their experiences and enhance capacities and build their skills around the social issues they face. We focus on building their skills of social analysis, communication, negotiation, and how to get information to combat obstacles they are facing in life, engaging them, self-educating. So peer support network and monitoring is center of our efforts, mentoring. Peer support network and mentoring is center of our efforts. What the challenge faced are that the formal regular education system does not offer scientific correct information and knowledge on reproductive and sexual health in adolescent age. The system also strengthens social control over the lives of adolescents. The big problem is this, the system is also working on this line, and especially for girls' lives. Only source of information we as girl and women get to strengthen ourselves is by listening and sharing information and knowledge from each other, add on new knowledge, scientific knowledge, mainly in remote areas where no digital devices allowed to use by girls and inter internet connectivity is very poor. Indira, you know, I'm sure you face challenges in, you know, especially as you said, going into those remote areas. Um, how do you, you know, you know, face these challenges? Tell us a little bit about them. Um, and what is the key into, you know, getting to these girls and giving them the right information? Due to the COVID experience, we have learned that when schools are closed, there is no space for girls. There is no private space. There is no mental space for girls in the at the home. So we established many Sakhi centers in their villages at the cluster level. And adolescent young girls managed, self-managed uh, these centers. So they managed these centers. We trained them uh, with all the information, knowledge, and uh, uh, skills to transform information to each other. So after these trainings, girls are very much capable to take help from the uh, health workers from the villages or mentors from the organization. So they are able to get information from very places. And we are uh, established in these Saki centers. We provide them digital devices as a common resource and internet connection as a common resource. So because of in the villages, there is girls, they don't have their own mobile phones and any other digital devices. There is a stigma around it. And there is a penalties if girls have take any device in their hands. So we think the common resources, creation of common resources is a 
good strategy and accepted by uh, elderly people also and we sometimes we call them and we organize some kind of dissemination to the elderly people how to get informations and how to get information about many things about the job opportunities about the education about the health so people are also agree and right now yeah there, there is some good examples to acceptance of these uses of devices and uses of I have so many questions. Upala, I I just want to take the time to ask an Indira a bit about this because of the fact that I can't imagine like why was it such a sensitive issue for a girl to have a device? Um what is the st- stigma against it? Can you tell us a little bit about that Indira? Well, there is a fear that girls are run away from home. Digital mm. devices give they give some other kind of liberty to girls. You know, there is a, a digital device give them space for themselves. Whatever they want to watch, what they want to learn in their own time. So, with digital devices, is is a good resource for the girls. So have you ever faced like I'm sure like backlash from the community in in your yeah, work? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we are working with the community. So we are taking a strategy close to families and we are engaging with the families not to community first. And when the family members when uh, convinced with this uh, strategy then slowly we go we are going in the community. Ah, I get it. Hmm. So a more intimate, a more uh, closer relationship from from the family unit within yeah. first and then going outwards. Um, yeah. So what we learn during the family uh, engagement, families, family members, father and mother are also not capable to face community pressure. So if you engage with the family, you can empower them also. through the information through the knowledge so family can uh, face the community questions community uh, ob- uh, obstacles very interesting um now opala now child marriage is described as a harmful practice um what is the, the unfpa's regional response to address it well uh, i would actually list a couple of uh, intervention areas that we are engaged in and these interventions though they are designed at the regional level they are actually implemented at the local level in terms of country level implementation because you know the incidences of child marriage are in the countries so while we design these interventions we implement these interventions in collaboration with multi stakeholders at the country level and there are primarily six major intervention areas that we focus on and i'm going to list them one by one the first is looking at income and economic strengthening for example you know cash transfers food transfers vocational training uh, finding favorable job markets for 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 young girls who have just graduated high school who may have had the fortune to graduate from high school to begin with so that's number one income and economic strengthening the second is education and life skills delivered through schools and or out of school programs like school adjacent programs and here again cash and in kind transfers for schooling is something that we always do to incentivize girls to stay in school and then we also have targeted and tailored life skills for example uh, co- comprehensive sexual education uh, life skills education girls empowerment programs like the rupan trend program in nepal which has shown a lot of impact in terms of raising empowerment levels of young girls and and actually helping keep them in schools and not getting the merit of by the parents the third intervention area is area relating to um, a focus and access to sexual reproductive health and rights and here again i list comprehensive sexual ed- education targeted at adolescent girls and boys as a very major intervention area and then adolescent responsive srh services which means sexual reproductive health services which are very very tailored to adolescents and young people for example i have seen in india in nepal in bangladesh that the primary we try and ensure that primary health care centers are situated near schools which means that young people can access the primary health care centers 
to access comprehensive uh, sexual and reproductive health services. The fourth intervention area that we focus on is really, really looking at gender and social norms change. Because at the end, a lot of all these harmful practices, whether we're looking at child early and forced unions, whether we're looking at female genital mutilation cutting, whether we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, son preference and daughter discrimination that manifests, for example, in gender bias sex selection, where the fetus is aborted because it's a girl fetus. You know, all these harmful practices really are rooted in gender inequality and manifested through harmful gender and social norms. So for us, the work that we do on gender and social norms change is very, very critical when, it, when we're looking at an intervention area for addressing and ending child marriage. And there are so many different uh, gender and change ap a norm approaches that we take from community sensitization and awareness to using the media, to having community-based meetings, to value-based dialogues, to policy-level advocacy and uh, to make sure that policies and laws that are being put in place are gender sensitive. Number five intervention area that we look at is system strengthening through a multi-sectoral, multi-level approaches, which is basically systems strengthening in terms of development capacities of workforce across sectors. And by workforce across sectors, I'm talking about teachers, uh, community leaders, uh, primary healthcare service providers, doctors, midwives, nurses, and so on and so forth. And the final intervention area really is related to girl-focused community-based interventions. For example, again, life skill education, comprehensive sexual education, uh, looking at digital platforms. I mean, Indira did mention some of the adverse effects of digital platforms, but we are looking at the positive impacts of digital platforms as well, and how through digital platform uh, interventions, a girl actually becomes aware of her rights as well. So these are the six different intervention areas that I'm listing, in income and in economic strengthening, education and life skills, access to SRA services, gender and social norm change, system strengthening via multi-sectoral, multi-level approaches, and girl-focused community interventions. So a wide range of uh, channels that we're looking at, and uh, indeed it, it, it does uh, kind of address the issue of what we've been talking about this whole conversation where it's not, you can't just pinpoint it, right, Upala, to just one aspect of the community, but you have to think about it as a whole. Absolutely. As I said, these are multi-layered, multi-level, multi-sectoral approaches. It involves top-down and bottom-up approaches, where top-down involves working with uh, policymakers, community custodians of culture, uh, with the health sector, and so on and so forth. And the bottom-up approach really means delving deep into norms, delving deep into community structures, delving deep into people's lives within families to bring about change. So, and it's also not just a multi-year approach. It is an approach that can take decades to change because it's a practice that has been there for decades to begin with. And there's so much complexity as what you just mentioned in our conversation that you've had, yes. you know, evolving pressures uh, from the outside. And at the same time, um, a very significant what you just mentioned there, Paula, and, and it ties kind of in with what Indira has been doing. And that is, you mm -hmm. know, um, looking at, at a different aspect where you go into the family unit versus going through the society as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. Going to you, Indira, in your experience, um, we've heard that there have been many changes in our society over the years uh, so what is there a need if there is uh, if you've seen it you know that if there is a different approach perhaps maybe that has to be taken nowadays uh that you've seen to overcome these challenges that changes every day so uh, as upala said multi-sectoral approaches is very important and whatever challenges i mentioned earlier these challenges can be met through having at a state level comprehensive policy and programs we need for overall well-being and development for girls, socially, economically, and politically also, including health, education, livelihood opportunities, entertainment, transportation, etc. There is a need to increase opportunities for girls and boys as well. 
it is important that civil society and government should work together for the good cause of ending child marriage, discrimination and violence against women and girls towards equality. Thirdly, more space should be created for the voices of girls and their role should be expanded at all levels of policy making, governance and as program lead. Uh, from listening to both of you, I can definitely tell that you have uh, worked so hard in this field. And uh, it sadly, often, I have to say, from the outside looking in, people who are not working in this field might think, oh, it is one of these problems that will always be there. Uh, but let's talk about it. You know, let's talk about how it really can be changed. Well, Paula, um, what solutions are needed to ensure real impact? in the reproductive health and rights of women and girls to be fulfilled in the region? I mean, when you talk about solutions, uh, there are so many solutions and it requires such concerted effort because the opposition to gender equality and rights, you know, bodily autonomy and agency of adolescent girls includes a vast plethora of solutions from the legislative and policy level to systems and services that I talked about, as well as to the how then these solutions can percolate down to the community and family level, because we also know that pushback really, really takes so many different forms and starts with opposition to language relating to sex, gender, and human rights to begin with. So when we're looking at solutions, the solutions are also multi-layered, multi-sectoral, and involves a plethora of different different activities based on uh, solu uh, solutions based on um, you know the ground context that we're working in. But definitely it starts with political will because political will then translates to development of laws and policies that can be gender sensitive as opposed to laws and policies that act to the detriment of girls. And here, for example, I cite the case of Afghanistan where there is a huge prevalence right now of early child and forced marriages because of the situation in the country when girls are getting married off at the ages of eight or nine or 10, but we are not being able to do anything because there is no political will to begin with where we have a very difficult gov government in that country that will not allow women even to go to girls to go to school or women to work in offices. So really the political will is the most important aspect in terms of having a solution. And the political will then also percolate down to having not just enabling laws and policies, but also then involves resources to implement those laws and policies. For example, setting up schools, setting up primary health care centers, you know, access to quality SRH services and so on and so forth requires political will as well as resources. So that's number one. The other solution, other, it's not again a solution, but these are in, in a way pathways to access services and rights. And the other pathway would be awareness of what services exist at the community level. Communities being made aware of what services exist. How do you access those services and to ensure that the services are not just quali of quality, but also are local community specific. What may work in Nepal, for example, may not even work in Sri Lanka or the Maldives when it comes to the, the kind of services that you're providing. And finally, I cannot stress enough the fact that the most important solution, which is really the problem, is that we have to change the prevailing harmful and discriminatory gender and social norms. That's an ongoing process because if we cannot change norms, traditions, mindsets, attitudes, and behaviors, whatever you try to do, even if you have the most enabling laws and policies in place, even if you have the best services in place, with, without having the right mindset, attitudes, and knowledge, which can then transform this discriminatory gender and social norms, it's impossible to bring about change, which also means that it works to the fact that you will not be able to make women and girls access services. So mm. the solutions are very much linked to problems as well. Okay, well, Paula and Jara, before we end our conversation, I really would like to give the opportunity to the both of you to uh, kind of give a kind of like a takeaway, a, a last word on this issue for our listeners. Um, 
because I'm sure a lot of people who are listening are worried, are concerned about this uh, issue, uh, but perhaps maybe may not know what they can do or what they can say about what part they can play in, in helping alleviate this uh, chronic issue that we have around the world. Um, Opala, would you like to start? Or Indira, can, can you give some last words? Yeah, thank you. So I think in, in this current situation, political, social, economical situation in the world, in the country, I think we need to um, create a strong movement in the leadership of young girls where raising their voices and their role expanded in the women's movement is very important. And as a citizen, the young girl's role is very important to uh, change the political scenario. Uh, the young movement is very important in the country. Paula? For me, yes, I agree that, you know, building the agency of girls to say no is very, very important. And we will continue doing that work at the community level in these different countries where there's a high prevalence of child marriage. But along with that, we also have to really take into cognizance that there are the other mega trends that we're witnessing. For example, the wars, the climate crisis that will have an impact, unfortunately, on higher prevalences of different forms of harmful practices, including child marriage. So the key, key takeaway would be to design interventions and programs which take into account all the different mega trends that the world is currently witnessing, including climate change and 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 humanitarian crisis and the economic crisis. Thank you so much, Upala and Indar, for giving us you know your insights on the situation, and uh, we look forward to seeing more work from you and also uh, seeing more change in the, the uh, situation that needs to change. Uh, for us to grow as a community, as a world together. This has been the latest episode of Hold On A Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific. Every girl counts. From our conversation, it is evident that girls, once armed with the right awareness, knowledge and skills, have the capability to be the building lights and beacons of change in their communities. All they need is the right support that they deserve. For more insightful episodes of Hold On A Minute by UNFPA Asia Pacific, follow our podcast pages on Spotify, Facebook, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Just search for UNFPA Hold On A Minute. See you in our next episode.